Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. Today I'm going to talk about some marksmanship techniques. I covered marksmanship as one of the installments in my Building a Better Gunfighter video series, but that was just me talking head in the basement. I want to get out here on the range, I want to show you how to grip, show you the stances that I believe in, and I'm going to tell you why the most modern techniques that we see in high level pistol competition might cause problems for the average shooter. If you think this might be interesting, hang around. I'm old enough that most people don't have the, the depth of experience uh, that I've had since the 70s when I first went through some formal police firearms training. A lot of people think the isosceles stance, the equal arms locked out in front, is something new, and it's not at all. I learned that at the age of 21 when I became a part-time police officer and went through the state-mandated pistol training course. After that, I saw what was going on at Gunsight. I thought that was pretty cool, so I saved up my money and I went to an API 250 class where I learned from Jeff Cooper and Clint Smith, who's now the honcho of Thunder Ranch, out at his own business. And they taught me the Weaver stance, as invented by Jack Weaver, an LA County Sheriff's Deputy with a 38 revolver. What I saw in the Weaver stance was a system that worked across multiple weapons, including long guns, as opposed to the isosceles, which really only works with handguns. So I come at this from a different perspective. Now, most of you have probably heard at one point or another that if you shoot the Weaver stance, you're going to get killed, that it's antiquated and terrible and you shouldn't do it. The reality is the way most people shoot today in sort of a modified isosceles, not arms locked out, but arms bent just a little, actually looks exactly like the way I was taught to shoot the weaver. When you ask those people to demonstrate a weaver stance to you, it is so grossly exaggerated that it's nothing like the original. You gotta go back 30 or 40 or 50 years in this game to understand the cyclic nature of what we do in firearms training. So I'm going to show you today why the Weaver Stance is not a bad thing. In fact, it, it's my understanding the gun sight doesn't even call it the Weaver Stance anymore. They call it a fighting stance, and that's really what it is. It's squared off the way you would box or the way you would go into a lot of martial arts. So it's a more practical thing to me, but here's my bottom line. If the way you grip the gun and the way you have your stance works for you, that's okay. This, this is an exaggeration, but if you can shoot over your shoulder with a mirror and get the hits in the right amount of time, I'm not going to argue with success. But there are ways we can do it better. And I'm going to tell you a couple stories along the way to illustrate how the way people are being taught to shoot today can cause some problems. And how to get around those problems. Probably the first thing we should talk about is simply how you grip the gun. Plastic framed, striker fired pistols occupy the holsters of most cops nowadays and most concealed carry holders as well. Okay, something like the Glock or a clone. Glock was not the first polymer frame pistol. Actually, uh, Heckler and Koch made one of those years ago called a VP70. But that combination of striker and polymer has now taken over the market. So the way you grip, good solid grip with your hand, strong hand, I'm, I'm right-handed, but we can do this left-handed up as high as you possibly can, and I'm going to give you some close-ups of this, high as you can on the web of the pistol. The higher you get, the closer you get to that bore angle, the less muzzle flip you will get. There are some pistols which inherently have a low bore angle. Glock is one of them. For years I carried an HK P7, the squeeze cocker. Its bore axis is even lower yet. SIG pistols tend to sit a little higher up. So they tend to get a little bit more muzzle flip. I'm, that, none of this is bad. I'm not knocking any particular platform. 
It's just that you need to get as high as you can to get a solid grip on that pistol. Where we go with the second hand is where we kind of differ. Most people are being taught now this kind of a grip. Thumb down, left thumb forward, and this wrist has to be kind of bent to do that. I'm not sure I like that, and I'm going to tell you some examples of problems it has caused. So originally, let me demonstrate with a, a 1911. This is what I used when I learned the weaver stance at gunsight. Okay, here's a close-up of the 1911. And as I said, Jeff Cooper taught, thumb on the safety, hold it down. Thumb on the thumb, hold it down. That's going to make sure you don't inadvertently throw this thing up during recoil and make the pistol stop firing in the middle of a fight. Thumb down, thumb down. Now, there's a little bit of a gap here where you don't have the palm of that hand against that grip the way some people think you should have. And that's where that thumb forward grip does. If you, if you put that thumb out forward and you rotate that wrist, you can get a little bit more skin on the gun. Does that help absorb recoil, give resistance for the pistol to work against? Not necessarily. Can it cause problems, as I've mentioned, getting up under a slide release? Not on a 1911, okay? In fact, I can go on top of that if I really want to and hold it down as well as I'm holding the thumb down. The reason I abandoned the thumb on thumb was when I started shooting a custom 10 millimeter 1911. With a really hot load, say a 200 grain hard cast bullet at 1200 feet per second, you're, you're generating the recoil, very similar recoil to a 41 Magnum. By holding that thumb down, this thumb started to hurt with recoil because this pistol's coming up and this thumb is trapped between the pistol and my other thumb. By just rotating that a little bit, keeping the, the wrist straight, but getting it slightly ahead, then I didn't have a problem with the 10 millimeter. So that's why I've adapted, and this will still work with everything. But this, where you rotate that hand forward, I think you're weakening your grip. A number of years ago in the Illinois State Police, they had been carrying Glocks about eight or nine years. Their full-time SWAT operators had, them, had gotten themselves weapon-mounted lights on the, pick, the forward Picatinny rail. When they went to those lights, and they were not using Glock lights, they were using uh, Surefires, I believe, they started to get a lot of malfunctions. And it got to the point where Glock was contacted and we were ready for a meeting with Glock. They were gonna bring two engineers from the Smyrna, Georgia plant and fly one over from Austria. Glock has the lion's share of the police market. And when a police agency has a problem with their pistol, they want to figure it out and they want to fix it. They have great customer service. Whether you like Glocks or dislike Glocks, I don't think any manufacturer in the system today has better customer service than Glock. So before Glock showed up, they gathered in from the SWAT, full-time SWAT teams, those pistols that were most likely to malfunction. And we were going to demonstrate those to Glock in, on Monday afternoon. So Friday, I was sent down from the academy. I had, had run the range at an earlier point, been in charge of the firearms training unit. I was back at the academy doing other things. So they sent me down as kind of a technical advisor. So I go down on Friday afternoon with a couple of other guys, and we're gonna shoot these bad pistols and see what we think could be going on. <clears throat> when I got there, one of the range officers, a good friend, he said, uh, give Fairburn Greg's gun. That thing will never get through a whole magazine. And he said, we, we averaged at least two, two malfunctions on every magazine of 15 rounds. Okay, they're carrying Glock 40s, uh, the Model 22s. So it had a weapons light mounted on it. I loaded up three magazines, so 45 rounds. I go down to the line and I burn through 45 rounds as fast as I want to shoot them, and it runs 100%. When I turned around, this range officer standing in there with his mouth open, and he goes, how did you do that? He loaded some magazines. He's getting two or three malfunctions in every magazine. I loaded three more and I went down and burned through 45 rounds, no problem. So he said, okay, tell me what's, what's going on. Tell me what you're doing differently. And he and I, I had had discussions over the years about isosceles or weaver, okay? Thumbs forward or thumbs back. We did not agree and clearly we would never agree. So my answer was, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing differently because you don't believe me. 
But here's the bottom line. It should work for you as well as it does for me. So I agree there's some kind of problem here that we need to work through. Now this range complex for the, the State Police Academy had a number of ranges and, and they had a qualification shoot for local troopers going on next door. So we took a break, I walked next door, watched them finish up their qualification and I grabbed one of the guys I knew. He was not a road trooper, he was essentially an accountant, but he was a trooper and had to do his qualification. But when I watched him shoot, he's shooting with a grip and stance a lot more like mine than the current way that they're being taught. He'd been on the job 20 some years, close to retirement. So I brought him next door. And I told the range officer, I said, load me three more magazines, give them to this guy, and I don't think he's gonna have any malfunctions either. He walked down to the line, he burned through three magazines, not a problem. We said, thank you, he went on his way. Now the range officer was completely dumbfounded. What are you doing differently? And I knew it was gonna be an argument and a fight if I told him, I'm shooting with a stronger grip and a stronger stance. Any semi-auto pistol, if you could hang this from strings and remotely fire it, it would malfunction virtually every time. These are recoil operated, not gas operated like many rifles. An M16 is gas operated. That, that cycle is gonna happen as long as that cartridge fires. These things need something to recoil against, okay? If they don't have a solid platform to recoil against, they may only get partially open, short stroke. That means they may kick out an empty cartridge, but not go quite far enough to pick up the next round so you have an empty chamber. Or they may get all the way back, kick the, kick the empty out, but they have kind of used up all their energy to get there, so they go very lightly back forward and you stub the bullet on the ramp and it won't feed into the, the chamber because you need more energy to push it in. So the, the more firm grip, the more firm stance you have, the more likely that is to work. Okay. When I was in Wyoming, uh, the captain in our sheriff's department, big guy from Chicago, six foot six, Army a warrant officer in the Army Reserves, SWAT guy from the beginnings of SWAT. He didn't like 1911 pistols. And I said, why? He goes, damn things malfunction all the time. I said, well, the next time we qualify, bring one of yours and show me. So he did. And he could not get through a magazine. He was getting short stroking. Not coming, not picking up a round or stubbing around up the feed ramp, classic. And I said, do you want me to fix it for you? Well, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I got my toolkit out, I disassembled the weapon, I took the recoil spring out and I cut about two coils off the recoil spring. So I changed it from a 17 pound spring into about a 15 pound spring. It worked. Suddenly that pistol, he couldn't make it quit. And he said, what's the deal? And I said, well, you're a really big guy, but you sort of shoot like a girl. You don't have a real firm grip, you don't have a real firm stance, and that weapon has to have something to kick against. So by lightening the, re the recoil spring, I made it work for you. That will fix a lot of the problems we see with shooters on the range today. Those springs are made for a good firm hold and full powered ammunition. If you're using cheap ammo that's not up to specifications, if you don't have a really solid grip, you're gonna get some malfunctions with it. So what I saw in those test pistols, the Glocks, my firm grip was enough so that the energy of that slide worked perfectly. But this kind of a grip with the thumbs forward and sort of an isosceles stance, not locked out, but broken back a little bit, did not give the pistol as much firmness to recoil against and they started getting malfunctions. Glock decided that I was right. They should work for everyone. And what they, they took a couple of the pistols with them, they replaced them, they put them on high speed photo analysis and decided that the four points that the slide works on in a Glock plastic frame, excuse me, polymer frame, those four points allowed the flame, frame to flex quite a bit when you added a couple of ounces of, of light out on the Picatinny rail. So it's my understanding they moved those four points slightly farther apart there are five generations of Glock pistols, but I know for a fact there are probably 20 little variations of them in between Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. They are constantly making minor changes to improve what they have. 
And ultimately, they took the 2400 pistols we had, swapped us back for very minimal cost, and gave us that new design that they thought would work better with lights. But the way you grip and the stance you use can affect the reliability of your pistol. So I talked about how the grip on the, you have on the pistol, how that can cause malfunctions by just not giving a lot of resistance for that slide to work. 90% of the people plus, never gonna have a problem. The more you get under stress in your firearms training, speed stress, yelling stress, at a good training class or with a bunch of guys out there coaching each other, the more you get under stress, the more you will see these minor problems jump up in front of you. So you need to train under stress as much as possible to debug your system, to see if you're gonna get those malfunctions because you didn't get the great grip when you drew from the holster. You don't have a great left hand position or weak hand positioning in a gunfight. You're moving, the pistol's cocking around on you. That's when you find out the problems you're gonna have. Not just slow fire, general shooting at a, at a, especially an indoor range where you can't even draw. You gotta get under stress to find out if that's gonna happen. There's another problem that we've seen with this forward grip, forward thumb technique. It has been alleviated for the most part, but I have still seen it crop up on occasion. And I'll put the Glock down and pick up a Beretta. This was the first time we saw this happen. And uh, as a deputy in Wyoming, when I started, you had to have a 357 revolver. We lobbied for semi-autos with the sheriff. He was uh, not in favor of them. We eventually got him talked into it. When the army adopted, or the, the military adopted the Beretta and called it the M9, the captain that I, that I mentioned that had problems with his 1911, he was army buddies with Warren Barron. And Warren was the president of Beretta USA, so he could, he could get whatever cool toy he wanted from Beretta. When they standardized that first M9, and it went through several generations of changes while the military had it, the, the civilian copy of that came into the country marked 92F. We got a dozen 92Fs, probably some of the very first ones that came in the country and we converted our department over to those. There were a couple of jailers who still wanted to stay with revolvers and that, that, that was fine for them. So we had the, the Beretta 92F. This one I borrowed, it's a 92FS. These pistols go through variations as problems are identified, all of them do. Glock does, Beretta does, everyone. When I was assigned to do pistol testing at, at Illinois State Police, they've been carrying Smith & Wesson double action, single action, nine millimeters ever since 1967, the original Model 39. They thought it was time for a change. Plus we identified that an awful lot of their shootings involved vehicles. And if you're gonna use a nine millimeter to get through auto glass or bullet body metal on a car, really you kind of have to open the door for it first. That light bullet does not penetrate well through those intervening problems. 40s with a 180 grain bullet was gonna do better. 45s would be better yet, but there was no single stack, small frame 45 that the smaller troopers could handle other than a 1911, which had to be carried cocked and locked. And when we told the upper brass that if you're gonna go with a 1911, you gotta carry it cocked and the color drained out of their face because they just didn't understand that it was perfectly safe, but it just didn't seem that way to them. So we settled on the 40. The Academy commander said, test every major brand, but whatever happens, you're not gonna get a Beretta. When I asked him to explain that, he had been to a conference with Academy commanders from around the country, and the Ohio Highway Patrol commander had told him that they were getting rid of their Berettas, they were gonna get something else, he didn't say what, because they had had their 40 caliber full-size Beretta pistols lock open during a gunfight when they still had rounds in the magazine. And that's a bad thing to have happen in a gunfight. At the very least, you have to tap the rack, try to get back in the fight. But they had dash camera video of these pistols firing three or four rounds and then locking back in the middle of a gunfight. So he said, I can't imagine we're gonna get the Berettas. He said, you gotta factor that into our testing. Yes, sir. Now I knew a guy from the Pennsylvania State Police that I had met at a conference one time. He was a fellow gunsight graduate. He was a range officer at their academy, and they carried the very same Beretta 40 caliber and even fired the same, the same load, same ammunition. So I called him and I said, hey, have you ever had this happen in Pennsylvania? And he said, nope, never seen it. 
at all. And I said, how much do you know about Ohio and the problem they're having? And he said, quite a bit. He said, actually, a couple of us were sent over to work with their range guys and see if we could figure out what's going on. He said they had changed ammunition, they had changed magazines. He said they'd even changed the cleaning solvent to see if somehow that was causing a problem for them. He said, I watched them shoot, and within about two minutes, I could tell them what the problem was. They're shooting this forward thumb technique, which he was not familiar with. This was just starting into law enforcement in the late 90s, and it had been adopted from the top level competitors in USPSA, IDPA, those guys that are going for every extra point they can get, every extra tenth of a second they can cut off. These are the techniques they're using. So the cops said, hey, if it works for them, it should work for us. Y yes and no. He put those shooters under a little bit of stress and he replicated that problem and saw them lock open on the training range with rounds still in the magazine. The academy commander was not to be convinced, however, and my friend from Pennsylvania said, we understood very early on that the boss wanted SIG pistols and by God, that's what they were gonna get. And if we showed him a way to alleviate the problem with the Berettas, he didn't care because he wanted SIG pistols and they eventually got SIG pistols. We did not see that happen with Glocks until troopers decided by looking on the websites that they could get an extended Glock slide lock. The extension on that lock could involve their thumbs. And then we started to see a little bit of locking open with rounds still in the chamber. Departmental policy said you can't swap out parts, you've got to use what came with the pistol. So when the armorers found out they replaced the standard slide lock, pistol went away, or the problem went away. Okay. So a little bit of forward, keep your wrist straight in my opinion, not that. And here is the revolver. Smaller than the big hand cannons, but the principles are just the same. It's empty, it's safe. Rotate that, get that thumb way out there. There's your, your flash gap between the, the cylinder and the back of the barrel. You fire a 38 like that, it's gonna hurt like hell. I saw a photograph of a guy who fired a 460 Smith & Wesson Magnum with his thumb in there. And the word you have to use for that is amputation. He lost about a quarter inch off the end of that thumb. Cut it off almost as sharp as a knife would because of the power of those high intensity cartridges coming through that flash gap. So with a revolver, thumb down, thumb down, get it out of the way, you're gonna be okay. But if you get that thumb out too far, you try to use the same grip technique with a powerful revolver that you do with a semi-auto, you're gonna cause a problem. I like to use a system that will work the same for everything. I think the weak grip comes in the bend of the angle. You gotta bend that wrist to get that angle. And a straight wrist is stronger, resists more than a bent wrist. That's just my philosophy. Feel free to comment. I know there's gonna be a lot of you tell me what an idiot I am. That's fine. I base my theories on real world experiences. What I've seen, what have I analyzed and what I've identified it. Most of these problems can be trained through. If you want to shoot thumbs forward and it works for you, you don't get malfunctions, you don't lock it open by accident, God bless you, go for it. Whatever works for you is okay with me. But what I'm telling you is some of these high speed, low drag techniques that we see the competitors use they work for them for slight advantage because they're shooting 30, 40, 50, 60,000 rounds a year. They can train through little idiosyncrasies. Do you shoot that much? I sure don't. I was training cops who had four shoots a year. That's 200 rounds a year to maintain their pistol shooting skills. High speed, low drag techniques cannot be maintained with that shooting level. Simple, basic stuff can. So simple, basic stuff is the way I think we need to train for pistols. Okay, so that's my philosophy on how to grip the gun, what to do with your thumbs. Some degree of thumb forward is fine, but test it under stress and see if it's gonna cause a slide to lock open. If your pistol doesn't do that, then God bless you, go on. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is the stance itself. Okay, if you think you've learned something in this, then I ask you to subscribe, give me a thumbs up, uh, remember my book, Building a Better Gunfighter, it's available on eBay or uh, my website, dickfairburn.com. I hope I'm giving you kind of material that will make you think and improve what you do 
to keep yourself safe out there. Thank you. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, Bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Last one. Ready? You ready? Yeah. That's all there is till next time.